Hi everyone and welcome to In Deep Geek Live. This is the latest in a series of live streams going through the history of uh, Westeros. Uh, right from the very beginning, uh, we started off with the Dawn Age and now uh, we've reached up to the Voynish Invasion. 10,000 ships, the story of Nymeria. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to cover that as we always do, uh, focusing on questions from my patrons as the shape of this, uh, but trying to get as many questions as I can from the chat as we are going through. Um, I do always try to start uh, with some news from the, the wider world, a sort of geeky TV and film. There's been a lot this last week uh, in the, the slightly wider world. The Witcher season two, we have now got the full trailer. Uh, which is, I don't want to sort of overplay it too much, a lot of the material there is from season one. It's telling the story about where we've got up to, but we do get first looks at people like Bessemer, for example, and a good look at uh, Ker Morhen. Uh, so it's if you're interested in that, do go. Uh, it's on my Twitter. If you go and look for Indie Geek over on Twitter, you'll see a link to it there. Other things that are happening... Babylon 5. If you are a fan of classic science fiction TV shows, you will almost certainly remember Babylon 5, which was fantastic. This was a, quite a while ago, but it was a pioneer when it came to uh, genre TV. It pioneered the five season story arc. A lot of the time, uh, sci fi just went with just a, uh, episode by episode or maybe a whole season, but with uh, Babylon 5, it went in with this intention of having a story arc through the entire run of the show. Lots of other shows have picked up on this and gone with it. I'm sure they weren't the first, but they were the first in my world to sort of really popularise that. Uh, and it was excellent. It is going to be rebooted. We have had news. Um, and it's going to be rebooted by the same showrunner who did it before, which gives me a little bit of hope that this is, uh, is going to be quite good because take a, a great story, some great characters, and then you update it with, with all of the modern graphics that we've got and storytelling techniques that we've got these days. It should be amazing. Thirdly, also in the world of sci-fi, if you're a Doctor Who fan, I am. Uh, I don't know whether you spotted it. Russell T. Davis is coming back to be the showrunner of that after the upcoming season, uh, which is, I think, uh, really quite good news. I, I thought he was he was the first showrunner of the. Um, it wasn't really a reboot of Doctor Who. It was uh, it was a bringing it back. Uh, but he was the person who was in charge for Doctors Nine and Ten. Uh, there were some excellent stories while he was there. Um, so I think this is a safe pair of hands. Um, and the other thing to note with this is that he has said before this became news. He has said a few times how. He felt that he was showrunner of Doctor Who maybe 10 years too early because he's got all of these ideas buzzing around about the Doctor Who universe, spin-offs here, spin-offs there, maybe a whole dedicated channel to it. Um, who knows? He's got lots of big plans. So expect to see that entering Doctor Who, entering this world that we've already got with uh, The Witcher, Game of Thrones, um, Star Wars, of these big franchises branching out uh, to be not just film franchises or uh, TV franchises, but expanding out into as many different areas as possible. So that's uh, that's the third thing. And the final thing, again, if you want to get a link to it, it'll, it'll be on my Twitter, The Sandman. This, for those who don't know, this is Neil Gaiman, graphic novel. It's really his first, or one of his first, major things to get everybody's attention. Fantastic graphic novel. Uh, I'm not hugely into graphic novels, but even I think it's amazing. And this has been bought up by Netflix and they are turning it into TV show. And we've now seen the first snippet from it. And if you want to see Charles Dance summoning dream, uh, it's everything you imagined it would be. So do go and check that out. So a lot of interesting things uh, coming up. In terms of uh, House of the Dragon, that's still filming. Uh, they're they're moving. It's been coming up to six months now, so they're starting, I think, now to get towards the end of filming for season one. Expect that 
Um, I think probably in the first half of next year. I think that's where we're going to find out about that. And Lord of the Rings, it's a long wait still for the Lord of the Rings TV show. It's that September next year. But lots going on, uh, as I say, in the much wider world. Um, uh, lots of uh, fantastic people in the chat as well, I noticed. So uh, just a huge uh, thank you, first of all, to my... Uh, moderators, I do have the most wonderful group of moderators who um, work in, in the chat, just making sure everybody's uh, uh, safe and having a good time in there. So thank you very much, moderators. I hugely appreciate it. If you are in the chat, please do uh, show them a little bit of love. Um, also, Britt Logan, thank you so much for an incredibly generous super chat just before uh, we went on air. I hugely appreciate it. Um, so let's get on to today's subject. Um, and just to kick off, um, Mara Lee, uh, hi Mara, saying, what was the Rhoynar migration all about? and Why did Nymeria choose to finally settle in Dawn? Well, I think this gives me the opportunity to set the scene and then we'll, we'll do questions moving off of this. So in terms of the overall history, last time we were talking about the Andal invasion. And the Andal invasion took place over centuries. It wasn't just one huge uh, group of ships at the same time landing over in Westeros and invading. It was like a drip, 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 a few ships here, a few ships there, one family coming across here, another there, a battle in this place, long period of peace, families intermarrying over there. And slowly, slowly, they took over most of what we would now call central Westeros. The north they did not, the Iron Islands they did not, Dawn they did not, except for a few families uh, in the north of Dawn. So Dawn at this stage is still largely uh, first men, though with um, an element of uh, the Danes, probably a different ethnicity as well. And having been there, uh, separated off from the west of Westeros for a long time, they have developed their own culture. So Dawn is already feeling very different and is a myriad of small petty kingdoms. So that was the Andal invasion. That was, depending on your, who you listen to, that was four, six, eight thousand years ago or maybe even as few as 2,000 years ago, but the Rhoynar Nymeria was 1,000 years before the story we have. So we're moving a lot closer now to, uh, to the current time. The, the Rhoynish nation existed, as the name suggested, along the River Rhoyne in Essos. So they were a... a, a civilization which was not one whole empire it was lots of different city states effectively self-rule but joined by a culture now this culture involved uh, worshiping of river gods we'll come on to that in a moment but also it was very developed uh, it was they who were teaching the andals a lot of their metalworking skills uh, and the the cities that we read about sound delightful. They they they're all about fountains and and rivers and uh, terraces and uh, celebration cities. It sounds like a beautiful, wonderful culture. And although yes, they fought battles and wars when they needed to with Andals or whoever else. Broadly speaking, they were an open and accepting culture to the extent that when the Valyrians, who were then the rising power over in uh, Essos, they started moving in towards the Rhoyne, the, the Rhoynar said, there's, there's enough of the Rhoyne for all of us. Come, settle, have make, make, make yourself some trading ports and things. And so they did, and they started establishing trading uh, uh, ports, which became... Uh, towns, which became cities. And before you know it, then suddenly this welcoming with open arms started to lead to tensions. This, These tensions spilled over into wars. The first one seems to have been 
uh, caused by which is the first turtle war all of the wars they had these delightful names the fisherman's war the turtle war the spice wars the 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 first war was it would appear when one of the great turtles in the Rhoyne uh, was hunted down killed by some valerians or maybe not even the valerians themselves but those who were in the valerian freehold and because this was uh, a holy symbol for the Roynar, they took exception to this, there was a war. Now, there a number of these wars happened over a period of centuries, and sometimes the Valyrian side won, sometimes the Roynar side won. How could they have possibly won against the might of the Valyrian freehold? Well, this seems to have been a matter of they had a lot of water magic. We hear rumours about um, them sort of being able to flood entire cities and uh, shoot jets of water and things like that. So there clearly was sort of magic going on against the dragons. But the turning point came when uh, finally uh, we get the, the Valyrian sort of pushed it a little bit too far and this guy called Prince Garin, who uh, was in Troy Rain, which was like their festival city, um, he, it later became the Soros, he raised a massive army of all of the Roina. Previously, they'd been just dealing with these things in their own city-states. They hadn't ever really come together as one great whole culture, civilization, but this time now they have. And he marches this his army down south, down the river Rhine towards Valantis splits his army into three, one down the west bank, one back down the east bank, one huge navy keeping track down the middle of the Rhine, and they were just sweeping everything before them. They, they were winning battle after battle. He became known as Garin the Great. The Rhoynar were loving it, uh, and eventually the Valyrians had to respond. Three dragons came, attacked the army, and got defeated. Two of them got shot down, a third had to uh, fly away wounded, and then finally the Valyrian said, well, this is too great a threat that just has to be dealt with, and they sent apparently 300 dragons. 300 dragons came, and there was nothing that the Roynar could do. They just got wiped out. Now, uh, following on from this, uh, the Prince Garen gets captured, uh, I've talked before about the story of how he was then put in a cage back in Troy Rain. He summoned up uh, the, the water gods to uh, wreak revenge upon the Valyrians. And this is where Grayscale came from, a huge inundation of water. Many, of, many and much of the Valyrian army destroyed. Uh, but as far as we're concerned, the, the real action occurs even further north. Of, uh, of this further up the river, because there was one leader in the, the Ruinar who didn't like this idea of taking on uh, the, uh, the village and said that this was a bad idea, this is a war we cannot win. And that leader was Princess Nymeria. Now, she was proven right. But what's left? The, the army, the quarter of a million uh, of uh, of soldiers are all dead. What's left are children, old people, uh, uh, women. There were where were women in the army, the Roynar army. So this isn't just a matter of men and women, but uh, but this was the non-fighting people who are left. What's she to do? She gathers together all of the people, all of the Roynar who are left, and says, "We have to go. We can't. We can't stick around. We cannot face down." Uh, the uh, the might of the Valyrian Empire. And she says, bring all of your boats, bring all the ships you have, we'll, we'll head off. And they do, they gather together, they, they get into their ships and they head south down the Rhoyne. They manage to avoid Volantis. There's a huge delta at the bottom of the Rhoyne. They go out through one of the other routes, head to the high seas. And... Obviously, a lot of these boats are not seaworthy. They're river boats, and a lot of them founder. Some of them turn back. 
uh, get caught by the Valyrians. Uh, and Nymeria then heads on this long um, adventure, is probably the wrong way of saying it, but it's, it took many years. They go to the Basilisk Islands, they go to Sothorius, they go to the Sunset Isles, uh, they get head all they get to, to Narth, they head all over the place, and everywhere they go, it just does not work out. They 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 get ill. They um, uh, the the climate doesn't work for them. They uh, get caught by brigands. Um, some try to turn back. They get caught by the Valyrians. What's left is this kind of ragtag fleet. Feel kind of Battlestar Galactica feel going on here. This kind of ragtag fleet searching for a new home and they go via the stepstones some of the Roinar give up and settle on the stepstones there are apparently still some Roinar living there on the stepstones left from all that time and she arrives at dawn and they try they think this is this is our next best last best hope they land and she meets uh the house martel doran martel uh, and um so the, at the the martels she joins with them she marries in with the martels who were at the time one of many um small petty kings down there in the in dawn and she marries in and her people also marry in with uh, with all of the Martels. From then on, the house is technically called Ni House Nymeros Martel. We always just shorten it to Martel, but its full name is Nymeros Martel. And then they um, head off across dawn, taking one, again, taking many years, one petty kingdom after another, just defeating them until they are rulers over all of dawn. The couple of things to note, she burns the ships so they can't go back. Um, she tries to integrate as much as is possible. So the Dornish take on a, a lot of the, uh, the Ruinar culture, uh, but the integration is not complete. There are some who are left behind by it all. So that's the story. That's, that's the the overarching narrative that we've got. And I should probably say at this point, if you don't know, this is one of those bits of Westerosi history that they are considering, HBO are considering developing for a TV show. And when I say considering, it's um, it's in early pre-production. They've, uh, they've got a few people working on it. It's not been commissioned yet. Uh, the only one still, the only thing that's being commissioned is... Uh, is House of the Dragon, uh, but this is one of the front runners, and it seems to be something they're quite keen. So we don't know any more than that, but that will be the story they will be telling. Uh, Henry Cavill, thank you very much for the uh, super sticker. I hugely appreciate that. Um, Question from Roman Lakovets saying, uh, do you think George R. R. Martin named Rhoyne after either the Rhine or the Rhone, which are two rivers in Western Europe? It sounds too similar to be a coincidence. Um, yeah, I mean, I think he probably took inspiration from it. I mean, both, uh, both the Rhine and the Rhone are big rivers. Um, uh, I think... I don't think he said specifically one way or the other. I don't think the culture is specifically um, based on the cultures who are around there in, in sort of either of those two rivers. But uh, yeah, it's certainly that there is a name echo going on there. Um, Richard McCarthy saying, I think the story of uh, Nymeria ties into the same kind of misremembered myth. In classical history, ships were always, almost always burned before battles. Yeah, I'll get onto the, bur the ship burning in just a moment. Um, in terms of the myth thing, I think it's probably worth just picking up here. George R. R. Martin uh, is very clear that the early years, the early ages of Westeros and Essos, the stories we get are myths. We shouldn't believe the truth of them exactly. There's some truth there, but 
we shouldn't take them as, as, as absolutely true stories. The closer we get to the current day, the more weight we should start putting on things. So the story of Nymeria and the 10,000 ships, I think he would probably want us to believe that this is true, but some of the details may be um, exaggerated or misremembered. And in the world of Ice and Fire, the Maesters particularly pick up on the number 10,000. This is a this seems a very large number. This seems that nobody actually counted. So it just seems like a, a, a handy number for people. So the idea that there was exactly 10,000 ships, probably not right. There probably were a lot of ships. Quite a few of them were lost or turned back before they made it to dawn. So by the time they got there, certainly there were a lot fewer than that. Um, but it's probably worth pointing out that when they arrived at dawn, they they set off with a lot of children, but they had, and people who were not battle-hardened, uh, but by the time they arrived at dawn, everybody was battle-hardened to a degree, and the children had grown up and were then at fighting age. So that although they seem to have left without a, a, a sort of a fighting force, by the time they arrived in dawn, they were actually quite uh, an impressive fighting force. And there was, um, uh, they also had superior technology. They had really good weapons and armor, which was where the Martels could see a, a way into this. Um, okay, let's go to a question from Ben. What is, this is over on a Patreon, what is the faith of Dawn, as they weren't conquered by the Andals, so they wouldn't be so faithful to the Seven? So the, the faith, um, well, we'll start with the faith of the Roinar. The faith of the Roinar, when they were on the River Roin, uh, was that they worshipped a series of river gods. Now, the greatest of these was Mother Roin. Uh, Mother Roin was the river itself. They viewed that as their mother, the life-giving um, mother, the river. This was what their entire culture was based around. Um, and then there were other smaller gods. Uh, so the, the, the giant turtles, for example, they were, they, they were children of the Mother Roin. And uh, there was also the Crab King, who was like the bad guy, the op 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 opposition to the turtles. So they had lots of these kind of, they, they worshipped the river and they worshipped the denizens of the river. And it's this kind of bridge from the very ancient kind of anthropomorphized bits of nature to uh, a cultural religion where the river as a whole becomes uh, the 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 mother religious godlike figure. So that was the religion that they brought with them. When they arrived in West, in Westeros, in Dawn, clearly the River Roin wasn't there anymore. So this left them with a little bit of a, a religious conundrum, so to speak. Some, and I, we can talk about these um, uh, in a little bit, but some never never moved on. That's probably an unfair way of saying it, but they stuck to their religion. They stuck to their culture. They did not wish to intermarry with the Dornish. They found uh, the Greenblood River, and which is the biggest river there in Dawn, and they just tried to replicate their lifestyle on a new river. They continued to um, worship the old Roinish gods. And the, the name orphans comes from the fact that they they've lost their mother, they've lost Mother Roin. So um, there is a there is some who still keep hold of the old Roinish religion. Uh, others married into the uh, the Andals um, and uh, and the whatever first men were there and slowly over time the faith of the seven became um, the predominant religion within uh, dawn so they accepted it as a cultural thing 
But Dawn as a whole is probably the most ethnically diverse part of the entire Seven Kingdoms, it has to be said. So when we don't just talk about there being a religion of Dawn, there are lots. There will be still some who would follow the first men, effectively. There will be some who follow the Rhoynish gods. There are some who follow the gods of the Andals. Who knows what house Dane uh, support and worship. So there's a lot of different cultures and there's a lot of different uh, religions. Um, question from Sebastian Zumala. I hope that that's pronounced correctly. Saying greetings from Poland. Loving what you do. Thank you. Uh, my question is about the Roinar and their magic. In your Blood Raven video, you mentioned that Azora High's Tar Azora High Targaryen's bloodline was manipulated by Brynden Rivers. What we get is pure Valyrian, but with elements of the most magical ethnicity groups. One of those groups is the Rhoynar through Nymeros Martell. You then mentioned the Rhoynar water magic. Could you tell us more about their magic and how did they use it? So happy to, well, there's two elements there. Um, the the sort of the, the bit about the manipulation of the family tree. This is something you'd probably have to go back to my videos on, on Blood Raven to see through the whole logic. I, I, I had a video called something along the lines of um, the magical bloodline of Azora High, but it seemed very clear to me, still does, that one of the things that Blood Raven did when he had control was to get a very clear line um, for the Targaryens that had specific bits of of magical genetics fed into it if that kind of makes sense so he wanted uh, to make sure that he had the Starks and the targaryens um together this is where john snow came from but if you look back through the actual the line of kings the line that ends down with uh, rhaegar and goes up through eris the second and so on all the way up you'll see that they pick up on just a few families. The Targaryens intermarry with a lot of different families, but on that specific um, line of pedigree, I think they call it um, uh, in the genealogical world, if you look through that specific line, then they only have certain very specific magical um, inputs. House Blackwood are there, House Martell are there, for example. So this is, it seems deliberate. So that's that. Do go and have a look at that video if you're interested. In terms of what the Rhoynish water magic is, it is it is water magic, but it's, I think, probably fair to say that this is river water magic. And we need to distinguish that between other uh, types of magic. Not because I personally think the source of that magic is different but because they saw it as different this was what they were very clear that this was the magic of the river not just generic water magic this was the magic of the river so what does it do well we hear <coughs> pardon me we hear rumors through uh, the world of ice and fire and other places about things that they did for example having walls of water appear protecting their cities um, there, there's on several occasions we hear of cities being flooded by the ruin. This again seems to be a hugely powerful tactic for just getting rid of your enemies. Um, jets of water we hear about. And then finally and ultimately you get grayscale, which is, um, and when you get to the sorrows, when Tyrion goes through that, it's so foggy. This is water. The water of the Rhoyne has effectively come up and takes over the whole area. And this once was the festival city, bright, shining, sunny, and it's now foggy and dark, and the moisture is everywhere. And that is the magic of the Rhoyne. That is the Rhoynish magic. So that's the magic that they have. Uh, we don't know the extent to which that has come across. Surely the uh, the ability to do this is, but if in the minds of the Rhoynish, the magic is tied to the river rather than to uh, 
just their ability to do water magic. Um, and Lady Pushkin, you also said, hi, Robert, did someone say water magic? Anything to do with patch face? Um, and I would say, I personally, I think not. And this is why, is that you, the Roynish water magic is river magic. That's, for them, very clear. This is tied up with Mother Roin. The patch face was allegedly drowned at sea and then came back to life. That's what we know about him so if there's some water magic going on there this isn't the river roin this is whatever water magic the, the storm god or the merling kin king that would be a much greater um example for who might be behind that kind of magic um similarly you could look on the other side of Westeros and you can sort of talk about the, the, the faith of the drowned god and things like that. So um, I, I think it's very easy sometimes to sort of uh, try to put the types of magic or, or the, the broad spectrum of magic within the world of ice and fire into these kind of elemental things. Here's water magic, here's fire magic, here's earth magic, here's air magic. It doesn't seem to work just quite like that the each of these things seems to be very specifically broken down and as i say i personally think they all come from the same source anyway um let's have a quick flick through uh the chat fletcher reed saying i want Tyrion riding a giant turtle when danny invades king's landing uh, that's a fantastic idea. Tyrion, they did see a giant turtle. Tyrion did when he was traveling down the River Roin. This is this is one of the the I think one of the best bits of the books of Tyrion's journey as we see him exploring an entire new culture, civilization, world. He heads down the River Roin on the Shy Maid, meeting lots of or um, on on a boat with lots of very interesting people, but. He sees and experiences things which are completely different from Westeros. And they do see uh, a giant turtle. Um, I don't think that he's going to be, I love the idea, but the, but the giant turtles are connected in with River Roin rather than um, being uh, uh, ocean-going um, turtles. Um, uh, CLG, will Nymeria... And the 10,000 wolves take part in the Winterfell battle. Uh, okay, so I've, I've got a question about the link, which I will answer this one specifically, but I've got a question about the link between Nymeria the wolf and Nymeria the princess. So obviously we have Aya named her dire wolf after Nymeria, the princess of dawn. So we have this story. And... and she seems to have done it initially as a child because she was Nymeria was a warrior princess. Ned seems to be less sure about the warrior princess thing, saying, you know, actually she wasn't actually involved in all that many wars herself. Uh, she was just there caring for her family. Um, so Ned kind of casts a bit of doubt on that, but um. The fact that we've got the name Nymeria does seem to imply that there has to be some kind of foreshadowing link there. We know the fact that the, the, the Stark direwolves' names give some foreshadowing of the owner's fate. So I would say we should be looking, this is what I'll talk about a little bit later, we should be looking more towards what does this mean about Aya and her fate, how this is sort of reflective of Nymeria, rather than does this mean anything for what Nymeria, uh, the direwolf, will be doing. But um, in terms of Nymeria, the direwolf, the 10,000 wolves, I think that's, that's a fantastic. I mean, I have, I've heard that somewhere else before. Uh, she has got this super pack, uh, Nymeria, the direwolf. We've no idea how big this super pack is. The idea that there might be 10,000, I think it's a fantastic one. Great echo of the 10,000 ships. Um, and this is in 
the Riverlands, which is very much uh, connected in, obviously, with the uh, the Roinar and the the, the the river focus there. Uh, will they be involved in the Battle of Winterfell? Possibly, but the biggest issue for them right now is what they're doing in the Riverlands. The, the, the work of Nymeria and the Wolf Pack is starting to ramp up just in the books that we've seen, and they are deliberately targeting the en enemies of the Starks attacking fray baggage trains things like that so they will be involved in the taking back of the riverlands from the lannisters and i think probably they will be involved in the uh, attack on the twins that's just my gut instinct i think this is going to be uh, a, a lady stoneheart thing and i think that the um, the direwolves will get involved in that as well. Whether they then head north from there, it's possible, um, but it's it's quite a long way. Um, okay, let's go to... Uh, oh, see McBroom saying, Nymeria is going to lead the wolf pack back north and then stay north, so, not sailing off at the end of everything just because... Um, just because even though she worked so hard to finally get back to her pack. Um, uh, <laughs> Thomas the Kishmack is saying, I can see 10,000 trouts fighting for Lady Stoneheart, but wolves seems a bit excessive. No, I don't think, I, I wasn't suggesting that they are fighting for Lady Stoneheart. I was suggesting that they are fighting for House Stark and to get revenge on those who did wrong to House Stark, which is the same agenda that Lady Stoneheart has. So they will both be doing the same thing, uh, but she's not making them do something. Um, uh, Mara Lee uh, saying, I'm curious as to Nymeria's backstory, house family background. Was she part of the ruling house or family at the time? How did she become so powerful a leader? So this is... Um, this comes back to what I was saying at the beginning. The the Roynish nation, the Roynar, they were not one big, uh, all-conquering, centralised governing structure. They were a lot, effectively a lot of city-states and individuals who went up and down the River Royne, but they had a unifying culture, unified by the river. Now, Nymeria was based up in the Upper Ruin, and she ruled over one of the cities up there. And so uh, the the Ruinish had this a uh, lot more egalitarian approach to inheritance, which has come across to Dawn. Uh, so they it didn't matter to them the gender of the person who uh, who inherited it. It was just the firstborn. So they had princes and princesses um, uh, because they were city-states effectively rather than kingdoms or empires. Uh, so she was in charge of one of these city-states. And uh, th that's uh, her family. We don't really read about specifically what her house was, um, but... I think the clear implication, given the fact that she arrived and immediately could marry into the Martells, uh, that if she had previously been married, then she lost her husband um, in the war, that hundreds of thousands died there. She just took the people who were left, who um, I mean, I'm sure a few of the soldiers survived, but the vast majority of the people that she took, not just hers, uh, her city-state uh, citizens, but whoever was left uh, alive, children, old, young, um, uh, the, the ragtag fleet. Um, Lyle Hammack saying, no question, just a thank you for your great content. I will be listening as I head to work. Uh, well, thank you very much indeed. I hope you have a safe trip. Um, Question from Ken McKenzie saying, uh, hello, Robert, wanted to say thank you for so much great content while I recovered from the virus this week. I'm all right. I'm very pleased to hear that. Uh, curious if you will cover Nymeria's time in Sothorios. 
uh, yin is fascinating. Yeah, so um, I wasn't planning on covering it in huge amounts of uh, depth. First of all, yes, I'm glad you're you're recovered um, uh, from the virus. I know it hits some people harder than others, but um, if you've got past it in a week, that's good. So I'm very pleased. Um, the what they the, the Sothorius was. Uh, second place they tried the Basilisk Islands and then Sothorios, uh, the second place that this fleet arrived at. Um, and it just did not work out for them when they were there. And this is the story across all of these different uh, places, is that they, um, uh, that was where they came up against these, um, uh, I say brigands as brigands of the, uh, the sea, there's a better way, they're not pirates, but something along those lines. Um, who basically were trying to tell them to go over to Yin. Um, this did not work out, but Sothoris is not a welcoming atmosphere. Um, uh, and so what happened there, and this is leading up to the burning of the ships issue later, is that they kept their ships. It's almost as if they were thinking, I, I'm not 100% committed to what's going on here. And so eventually they just said no we're we're moving on we're, we're heading on from here uh, and that after that i think they went to the sunset or north i think after that and then the sunset islands um but yeah it was uh everywhere they went they lost a few more people so what we have left is the the rump of the nation uh we don't know quite how many uh fell on the way but it was quite a few um, uh, Austin Flowers say, what's a pirate's favorite letter of the alphabet? I'm going to guess R. Um, uh, question, uh, David Dine, uh, Dimo saying, a little off topic, but do you know what happened to the shadow of Stannis after Melisandre gave birth to it? Uh, is it stuck in the castle? She said there was old magic there. Um, I think it, I, I think it probably once it's, it's done what it needed to do, it disappeared. I don't think we've heard anything since then um, in of Storm's End of there being a, a shadow still lurking around. Uh, so no, I think it was just a it was a one shot thing. Um, uh, Kolnitsky saying, I think you for the super chat saying, is it time to switch to the June content? Um, uh, the June, I love June. June's a fantastic story. Um, I've not, I've not read it for a, quite a while and I've had to prioritize things, um, as I'm sure you understand. Um, so I've decided I'm, I'm not going to personally cover June, um, I will just appreciate it. There are some things I like to just watch and appreciate just as a fan um, without sitting um, scribbling down notes. I mean, it makes it sound like a, a woe is me. I mean, I love doing what I do, uh, but uh, yeah, it's a very different experience when I know that I'm going to be creating a, a video on something. I do have to be watching it with a critical eye and scribbling things down and pausing and rewinding and things like that. With June, I just want to watch it. I just want to Enjoy it. It looks spectacular from um, all of the um, the trailer footage that I've seen. Um, uh, in terms of where to go for June content, I recommend you go to Quinn's Ideas. He's he's been uh, the big, as far as I can see, the big channel covering June for the last at least two years, if not more. Um, and he does excellent videos. So please do go and check out Quinn's Ideas. Um, uh, reflective rambling. I've missed a super chat. Uh, apologies from Caius Ballerina saying, uh, were the Roinar for or against slavery? They were against slavery, so they didn't have, um, uh, they didn't have slaves. They were, uh, they became slaves in the, um, the Valyrian Empire afterwards. So, um, no, they were, they were anti-slavery and, Coming across to Westeros, they they stuck with that. It's actually it's quite a noticeable thing that in in Westeros slavery, apart from the Iron Islands, who they don't call it slavery, but effectively they they do 
have that. Um, slavery's never, none of the main groups of people, the first men, the Andals, or uh, the Roina, none of them were um, slave-driven cultures, uh, which means that when the Valyrians came across, when House Targaryen came across, they didn't come across to a culture where slavery was already there. So whereas historically they may well have been um, a slave um, traders and owners, there wasn't that culture there and that, they, that made it easier just to not do it. So, um, yeah, no, the, the, the short answer is no, the Roinar were not um, uh, a part of a sort of a slave culture. Um, quick, um, see, if I, see, I, see if I've missed any more uh, questions in the chat. Uh, I think I haven't, I think I've caught up on that one. Um, uh, the uh, Lam Royce, uh, William Royce saying the Roynar had the princes and princesses as their highest rank. Uh, yes, that's uh, that's the way it was. So they had, they didn't have an overarching king or queen or emperor or empress. The highest rank they had was prince or princess, and that was one of the many things that they took across into the culture in Dawn. Uh, a few people saying uh, that they've seen Dune. I would love to know in the chat if it's if it's as good as it uh, as it looks as it's going to be. Um, do, do uh, do tell me. Uh, and the real uh, YT saying, thank you. I just subscribed to Quinn's Ideas. Well, uh, good. I'm very pleased to hear that. Um, right. A question from um, Mara Lee saying, uh, we know that later Nymeria married Davos Dane, uh, but how and when did she meet up with him and become the then the founder of House Dane? I've always been curious about this mysterious house's backstory, so any information you can give us would be fabulous and will also help to shed some more light on this house and its beginnings. Um, okay, so uh, in terms of uh, the Danes, I think I've got another question on the, the Danes in a moment. Um, yeah, actually, let's. I'll tie this question in, if that's okay, with one from Catherine Furseth saying, Hi, Robert. Um, as always, thanks for an interesting lineup of live stream topics. I was curious about House Dane's role during the Nymeria Martell War to conquer Dawn. I understand that Vorian Dane was one of six defeated kings sent to the wall after Nymeria's final victory. Did House Dane then switch allegiance and fight for Nymeria and the Martells? Nymeria even married a Davos Dane later, so the relationship to House Dane must have been a close one. Also, why was Vorian Dane called the Sword of the Evening? Uh, not of the morning. Okay, so a lot of questions going on in there. Let me try and uh, uh, unpick all of these. House Dane is a very old house. We do not know how old House Dane is. Thousands of years old. The the legend that we have of them following this shooting star, which uh, came meteorite crashed down, Starfall the island. Uh, and from that, they forged the great sword Dawn. Um, this seems to have been thousands and thousands of years ago, perhaps the Dawn Age, uh, before the Age of Heroes. So House Dane were well established um, for thousands of years by the time that um, the, the um, Roinar came into Dawn. But if you think of your map of Dawn right over at the far western edge, that's where they are. And they were kings. They were one of many petty kings. Uh, they were the kings of the Torrentine, I think, which was the river that uh, Starfall is in the, uh, the mouth of, uh, the estuary of. So that is what they were for thousands of years. They were kings of their area. Then when we get Nymeria, who came in and uh, with the Martells, took on one after, this is over many, many years, took on all of these small, petty kings across Dawn, one after another, she took them all on. 
Um, eventually, she came to House Dane. She took on House Dane, um, mm. and the Danes lost. Now, the result of this was that uh, Vorian Dane, who was the king, he got sent to the wall. This is a fascinating thing. We, we covered this a couple of times, just in passing. But uh, this is a fascinating thing that the wall, this is a thousand years ago, all the way as far down south as Dawn, this was still a practice to send people up to the wall. Uh, so anyway, Brian Dane got sent up to the wall. We don't know the exact relationship uh, between um, him and um, uh, Davos Dane. Perhaps that was his son. We do not know. But later, much later, her third husband was Davos Dane, who was dashing, we're told. So uh, the the offspring of that then became the, the, the line of House Dane. So that's where we get this kind of uh, input from, from the House Nymeros Martel into House Dane. And House Dane came then, even before the intermarriage, they they supported uh, Nymeria in the rest of the conquest of Dawn, and the rest of the conquest of Dawn was mostly with the, the final house to hold out, the House Ironwood. House Ironwood, based in the north of Dawn, uh, right up towards the mountains, uh, and they held out for a long time. And before finally, and Nymeria herself accepted uh, the bending of the knee of. Ironwood. And this is why House Ironwood is probably the second biggest, most strong and powerful house in, in Dawn because they 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 hung they hung on for, for the longest. They were they had the biggest kingdom that was there um, in Dawn. So that's the sort of the history. Then, as I say, a few years later, after uh, we get Nymeria. Um, married um, someone from House Ulla, um, and then married um, into House Dane. Now, this, the extent to which this was a, a political marriage, it's not quite clear. It certainly would have done her a whole load of good to be uh, marrying other powerful houses uh, in Dawn to solidify her power. Once, once they'd gained control of all of Dawn, House Nymeros Martel, um, they weren't unassailable by any stretch of the imagination. There were assassination attempts on Nymeria's life. There were attacks from um, from overseas as well as uh, coming in from uh, from the reach of the Crown Lands as well. Tried to attack briefly. There there were lots of threats still. So it would have done good for her to be marrying into powerful other families in Dawn just to solidify her control. The the question there, I think it was Catherine who had the question about um Vorian Dane, who was the king uh, of House Dane, who got sent up to the wall. Why was he called the sword of the evening, not the sword of the morning? Well, we're, we're not given a definitive answer to this one, so I don't think uh, we can say for sure, particularly because we do not know the timing of this, whether he was always known as the Sword of the Evening, whether um, he only became known as the Sword of the Evening afterwards. If it's the latter, it kind of makes sense because he was the last Dane king. So for them... There, this was the evening of uh, the end of the day for House Dane, are no longer kings. So it would make sense if he got nicknamed the Sword of the Evening. Maybe there's some other cool story going on there. Maybe he was a uh, um, sort of a bad guy and didn't want to be good, uh, called the Sword of the, the Morning. Maybe he chose it for himself. We do not know, but that would be pure speculation. Uh, we do not have huge amounts of information about him. As I say, the thing that makes most sense to me is this is something which was retrospectively given to him as a recognition of the fact that he was the last Dane king. And uh, when we get Davos Dane, the, 
person who married Nymeria a bit later. He again is Sword of the Morning. So this seems to have been a one-off. Um, and then we go back to being Swords of the Morning. Um, Carl Karsnark saying, why are all the rulers of Dawn so seemingly sickly and weak? Uh, is it always a ploy? Um, well, a lot of them are. It's quite interesting. Yes, yeah, so Doran Martell clearly is. Um, Nymeria didn't give that impression. Um, uh, but the... Um, uh, I'm just trying to think what her nickname was. It the Yellow Toad? I can't remember. The, uh, the, the Princess of Dawn who was there when there was the Targaryen invasion. Uh, she lived to a ripe old age, but was not particularly well. So is it... Are, are they always unwell as a political point? I think that they were happy for it to be a political ploy. Uh, Dawn does appear to be somewhere that does engage in a reasonable degree of politics, it has to be said. Um, but um, it perhaps shows, um, I mean, I don't it might be reading slightly too much into this, but the more egalitarian, the more open approach that we do have within Dawn means that you have both male and female ru rulers, therefore the very macho approach, and I don't think there's any other way of saying it, that, that that is there in across most of the rest of Westeros. Just think of Tywin Lannister. Just think of the Iron Islanders. The, the, the huge amounts of the time, there's this very uh, patriarchal, um, uh, we might today call it toxic masculinity, uh, figure there heading up houses. That wasn't always the case down in Dawn because sometimes it was man sometimes it was a woman in charge and so perhaps that meant that there was no need to have this uh strong uh, approach to say to show i'm personally having to lead all of the forces into battle that's one thing which is clearly different uh between dawn and the rest of the uh the seven kingdoms is that the ruler of dawn it doesn't necessarily have to be the greatest fighter. It doesn't necessarily have to be the person at the front of the battle uh, all the time. Whereas in Westeros, the rest of Westeros, it is often the case. As I say, that's might be reading too much into it, but um, uh, it, it it's a theory I, I've had going on uh, for a while. Um, Uh, oh, Mathieu Dominique uh, saying, Dune, we have our first Dune review, people. Dune uh, was pretty awesome. Excellent. Main thing sticking out, CGI being nearly flawless and costuming being wonderful. I haven't read the books, but I really enjoyed the story the movie told. Eight and a half out of ten. Uh, excellent. So, um, good. Well, that means I'm very much looking forward to going to see it myself. Um, so, Dune, just for those who are book fans... As I understand it, the film that we've got now is covering roughly the first half of the main first June book. Uh, and um, uh, the rumour is that there will be, obviously, a second one to cover the second half of book one, but also potentially at least one more movie. There are lots of other uh, excellent June books following uh, that. Um Question, uh, well, Glenn Thrasher, thank you so much for the super sticker. I, I appreciate that, just saying thank you. Um, and Eric saying, the Roynar certainly had lots of experience fighting dragons. Could there be secrets of how to fight dragons still in Dawn from that time? Oh, interesting question. Well, it's noticeable that um, dragons, when the dragons did come and attack Dawn, in the Targaryen invasion, then they survived. Uh, the The rest of Westeros just had to bend the knee and accept defeat. Dawn did not, and they they did not have to bend the knee. It took them a century and a half, and then he, then they only joined the Seven Kingdoms on their own terms. So um, yes, there probably was some uh, residual understanding that. You, 
that dragons aren't undefeatable. It's noticeable that when I was talking about the the Prince Garin who led his huge force down to uh, attack the Valyrians, uh, and the first three dragons were uh, killed, two of them were killed, one of them was driven off, uh, they were shot down by arrows, apparently. And it's very noticeable that when we get to the Targaryen invasion of Dawn, how is one of the dragons killed there? Shot down by arrows. So th this does seem to be the, an understanding of how you how you kill a dragon, um, and also you hide, you 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 get away from it, um, uh, and there's a limited number of dragons that eventually they will go away. So yes, I don't think that they have got a um, golden bullet, so to speak. They've not got this uh, book of all knowledge of how to kill dragons. But, um, because I think they would have used that if they had uh, when they needed to kill dragons. But there is a, an inherited understanding that dragons are not just the nuclear weapons of, of Westeros. They can be defeated. Um, reflective rambling, picking up something for Permi Bird. Thank you so much, Reflective Rambling. I hugely appreciate it when people do this. Where is the impact crater? <laughs> if the Danes followed a meteor to get the metal for dawn and settled there, they should be living in an impact crater, not an island. Well, that's a good point. I think the implication, given the fact that they got uh, one that from the metal from this meteorite, they managed to get one. It's a great sword, so it's a, a big and long sword. Um, but it is just one sword, seems to imply that this was not a massive meteorite. This is not the kind of thing that you know, creates the Gulf of Mexico or something like that. This is, yes, this would have crashed down and created a, a, a hole in the ground, um, but uh, I, I don't know if you, the amount of metal to create a, a great sword, a meteorite this big, maybe, I'm not 100% sure. So um, I, Yes, there will be a crater. We've never actually seen gone there in the books, it has to be said, so we don't know. Maybe there is a crater there. Um, we we don't know. All we know is that they decided that that was the place that they were going to uh, set up home afterwards. It's an island, a reasonably sized island, so maybe there's a crater somewhere there and elsewhere there's the uh, the buildings. Um, uh, Liam Royce is saying, could the Sword of the Evening be the title of, say, a retired Sword of the Morning? Oh, I like that idea. I've not heard that before. That's a, that's a nice idea. So um, when we when we have Vorian Grey, the Sword of the Evening, he goes up to the wall. The question is, what what do you what, what do you do with the sword? Does he leave it down? And Starfall, does he take it with him? I personally think it's most likely, given how important that sword is to House Dane, that he decided that he probably would have left it down in Starfall. He probably would have left it there. He would have gone up himself and effectively, therefore, retired as the Sword of the Morning. So the idea that maybe then they gave him the honorific of the Sword of the Evening because... Uh, maybe they gave him another sword. I don't know. Um, that 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 works for me. I like it. I mean, I think that this is sort of an extra level to that he was the last king. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a it's a nice idea. Um, question from cloaked one picking up. Thank you, cloaked one picking up for uh, Mimi eight ninety saying hi, Robert. Love your content. I often wonder about Nymeria's age. How old was she when she left her home and when she came to Dawn? Well, we don't know. Uh, we're not told. Uh, she was queen of... Oh, not queen. She was princess of her city-state when um, the war started. And uh, then she gathered together her peoples and then she set off. She has to have been old enough at that point to 
um, have expressed an opinion about the pointlessness of their attack on um, the, the Valerians and also I would suspect to be calling people to her and, and have as much of a charismatic influence to persuade people to follow her. So, I mean, she must have been relatively young, but still old enough. So I don't know, maybe 20 something along those lines in the world of uh, ice and fire, then some people have greatness thrust upon them quite young. Rob, for example, 15, 16, uh, he's actually, that's the age at which he becomes uh, king of the north, king of the north. So maybe Nymeria was around that age. In any event, when she got, she spent several years traveling, then several years um, uh, attacking and invading and taking over Dawn. Uh, and then uh, by that time, she'd got herself through one husband and then she had uh, another husband who then died uh, and then had a third husband and she had a child with that third husband. So they, I mean, if she's still of uh, uh, childbearing years, shall we say, third husband in, she has to have been relatively young um, when she set out. Um, I think I'm talking myself around to the idea that she would probably was around 15, 16 at that, uh, at the early point, um, which makes her, when she arrives uh, in, in Dawn, uh, 20 early 20s by the time she's finished uh attacking and invading across the piece then uh, 30s 30 ish that's the kind of uh age that we're looking at and then she had uh, a long life uh, ahead of her as uh princess of dawn um bear island josh saying large impact craters here often form a lake with an island in the middle okay Good knowledge. Uh, thank you very much. So uh, maybe that's uh, uh, maybe that's what happened. Um, uh, da Vinci memes. Thank you very much uh, for that kind comment as well. Okay. Uh, Mondo man devout saying, can someone please tell me how long the live streams typically last, just so I can plan if I should uh, work now or wait. Um, typically, uh, I I tend to aim for two hours and rarely achieve it. Um, it does depend on the topic. Today, I'm going to try and keep it to around two hours. So um, uh, that means we've probably got about another three quarters of an hour to go. Uh, but sometimes if if the if the questions are coming thick and fast, then yeah, they can. Uh, I think I've done some live streams that have gone on well beyond three hours. But uh, I try not to get too, um, uh, too um, long because I appreciate people have things to be getting on with. Uh, uh, so uh, actually talking of which we're coming up, we've only got a few more questions from my patrons. Um, uh, Alejandro Martinez saying, hello, Robert, this is first time, my first time asking a question as a new patron. I'm so excited. Well, welcome to Patreon. This is, in fact, it's a perfect opportunity for me to uh, just to say, if you do wish to support this channel, the best way to do this is to join my Patreon. There's a link down uh, in, uh, possibly in the description. I'm not sure whether I've put it there yet, but I'm sure if you're watching live, there will be a moderator dropping a link in the, the chat uh, now. Um, as a as a patron, you get certain benefits. One of those benefits is having priority questions here for live streams. So uh, patrons, thank you. I always thank you. I always mean it. It's your support is genuinely the thing which allows me to devote the time uh, to this. Um, uh, so thank you very much. Um, actually, while I'm on it, I was reminded during the week, there's uh, my merch. I rarely, rarely mention my merch because I always forget. If you'd like some in Deep Geek merch, there's a link down below here. Um, two things to say about that. Uh, the first is I, I believe there is a sale on at the moment. Um, I, I go through Spreadshop, Spreadshirt. Uh, so um, the I think it's 15% off if you buy T-shirts and things like that at the moment. So do go and check that out if you're interested. Also, just as a little teaser, um, I've been saying uh, for a little while, the last few weeks, I've spent this last summer trying to do quite a few things behind the scenes to uh, sort of in improve 
uh, improve the product, improve what I can uh, provide you with. Um, one of the things you'll, I'm sure, have noticed things like the green screen. I'm improving the sound, the vision quality. Um, I've also been doing a little bit of rebranding behind the scenes as well. So at some point in the next two or three weeks, there will be some shiny new branding, which I'm very excited about. So if you're if you're a big fan of the the classic in deep geek logo and uh, now is possibly your last chance to get the merch so anyway uh if you're interested in that do go uh, and do that and i i'm sure it will be at least another year before i remember to plug the merch again um chaos ballerina um saying for austin flowers is Rhinar magic similar to the magic of the children of the forest that brought down the hammer of the waters now this is an interesting one um so the, the Children of the Forest's magic of the Hammer of the Waters doesn't seem to work with a lot of the rest of the magic that we've got. It's very Earth-based. It's very uh, Westeros-based, not sea-based. So the, the Hammer of the Waters itself, I mean, you can sort of put that as a or slightly anachronistic somewhere... Um, explain it and say yes this is absolutely fine uh, the children of the forest have got are in touch with nature and so there's of course they've got, they can do water maybe they can create an earthquake which causes a tidal wave you can explain it away in many many ways uh, but the the magic of the the ruinar is river magic um it's connected with the river uh, ruin uh, so it is separate the thing which is similar is the fact that both of them they can drown places so the what happened with the hammer of the waters seems to um if there was a land bridge and then that got turned into islands that feels um more than just like here's a whole load of water gushing over it because then the water would wash away and the land bridge would stay there but this appears more of like an actual hammer just banging down on it, cr cracking the land, as, uh, as it were. So that's the feel we've got with the Hammer of the Waters. The With River Roin, this we get, it's more like the river just sort of like, um, imagine if you, if you will that scene from the Lord of the Rings, the Fellowship of the Ring, uh, where you get Frodo, who's got across just to Rivendell on the far side of the river, and the Black Riders are there, and then you get the the river crashing down, washing them away. It's that feel, but on a much grander scale. And I should say, I don't think I said it uh, so far in this stream. The River Roin, don't think of your local river with the River Roin. The River Roin is massive. At the sort of towards the bottom of the River Roin. Uh, Tyrion's there in a boat in the middle of it and he looks both ways and he can't see the shore either way. This is, it is a river, but it is huge. This, it's, it's ginormous. It's, uh, I, I've not, not seen uh, personally rivers like the, the, the Amazon or something like that, but compared to some rivers I have seen like the Nile or the Ganges, it, it feels even, even larger than them. This is a massive, massive river. So if you can have the power of that whole river just rushing down, that is absolutely massive. So it's the same feel, uh, but whereas what happens with the River Royne is it seems to sort of destroy cities, what happened with the Hammer of the Water is it destroyed land, which is another level entirely. Um, so, yeah, they're similar, but um, of course, different scales, I would personally argue. Um, I think I was just, actually, I was start, yeah, starting from uh, before I went off on to uh, talking about a Patreon. Um, I was starting with a question from Alejandro Martinez uh, saying, I've always appreciated how George R. R. Martin made Essos so culturally and ethnically diverse. I know the plight of Roynar brought them, the Roynar brought them to dawn, and those that didn't fully assimilate remain orphans. But do we know of any Asozi with Roynish ancestry who are left in Essos? I believe Yandri and Isilla were orphans who returned home. Um, 
uh, I had a similar question for the Andals live stream, but never got around to posting. Uh, the books point out that there are many Asozi with Valyrian heritage. Do the, does the same hold true for the Roinar and the Andals? It probably matters little to the story, but I find it fascinating. Nonetheless. So, yeah, I think it is fascinating. Uh, the With the, the Roinar, what we have, I think, are um, the story I told was the high-level story. We have an army destroyed, and anyone who wasn't in the army escapes. That's the high-level story. Outside of that, it gets complicated, obviously gets complicated, because uh, Prince Garin wasn't the only one who got captured. Many of the, the army of the Roinar got captured. They became enslaved by the Valyrians. Some... Uh, we're, we're not really told of any great numbers, but some inevitably will have decided to stay, uh, not go with Nymeria. There will be some who have just hung around the River Rhine, particularly when you get further north into the tributaries. Uh, there's um, some will have hung around. We hear of at least a couple of times when people turned back on the voyages that they got uh, that were that took um, Nymeria and the ships the long trip all the way across to Dawn, that people did turn back. And they largely, again, got caught by the Valyrians. So, and then when they did get across to Dawn, you have the orphans of the Greenblood. Um, and they want to go, to go back. They can't. The ships got burned. But some do seem to get there. So um, you you name checked uh, a couple there, um, uh, Yandri and Scylla, who were the captains of the Shy Maid, the boat which took um, young Griff and Tyrion and all the rest of them down the River Rhine. They were orphans who came across back to the River Rhoyne. So we're not told of a particular exodus, but it makes sense that they weren't the only ones who did that. We're not told that they're unique in this. So what we actually have is a lot more mixed picture for the Rhoyne of the people who are probably still stayed there, some who came back later, quite a few who got captured and enslaved by the Valyrians, this means that there will be a lot of people with Roinish hereditary there because they didn't, they wouldn't just die out. What there isn't, though, are any of the Roinish cities. They are all destroyed. Tyrion goes, sees them as he's going past on on the river. They uh, they are not just not there anymore. They Completely decimated by the Valyrians. So the culture is not there other than a few people living on the sides of the river. We see a few there. Uh, the, the massive culture is not there, but there will be lots of people who retain the ethnicity. And I think a very similar story could happen with the Andals. The Andals moved west. Yes, their, their origin story is all about they were Hugo, Hugo of the Hill had a vision and said, there's great lands for you off to the west. And so they headed off. But in reality, they were also pushed out by the Valyrians. So the, the some will have stayed. Some will have been enslaved. Some will have um, uh, intermarried with people in Pentos or, or some of the other surrounding areas. Uh, so, yes, there will be some. But it's as the the culture as a whole did move across. Um, let's go to. I've got a couple more questions uh, for, over on Patreon. Um, so now is a good time to drop some more questions in the chat. I will. Uh, I will have a try and get through to as many questions as I can. Um, Paul Taylor saying disagree with you on Ruin slash Rhine. Uh, Roinar city-states are very much like the Hanseatic League arrangement, more so than Greek city-states. Yeah, I, I think um, 
Uh, okay, I mean, I accept your point. I, I think in terms of the the city structure, yes. So what you had um, across the, I mean, you probably more of an expert than me on this, but but uh, in a lot of medieval Europe, using medieval as a broader term as possible, then city states were the the rule rather than the exception. The countries that we have now in in Europe. Germany and, and Italy and, and France even were broken down into a lot smaller city states uh, as a rule. And yes, up and down the Rhine, there were indeed a lot of these kind of city states. Uh, what I was saying was not so much about that it, as the the culture. I don't think that the the idea of worshipping the river, um, the turtles, that kind of thing, he gained inspiration for from there for um, but um point taken uh, about the uh, the city states um i think i did have another okay yeah uh, Caius ballerina saying beyond the prince or princess titles and egalitarian ruling how else did the roynish impact dornish culture did any river magic have impact on geography um well, not necessarily river magic, but uh, we're told that they, because they understood water, then they had, could make much greater use of irrigation uh, and things along those lines. So when we get like the, the water gardens, Dawn, as we know, is largely desert. So any elements of sort of water management that have come in with the Roynish. So there's that. Uh, there's also Planky Town. Planky Town is their main port, uh, and this is it's called Planky Town. It's a lovely name to say uh, because it is made up of um, boats, the the sort of the river boats, very flat boats, and they're all sort of like tied up together to create a, a Planky Town, uh, and that becomes a market. And that very much, if you've seen the sort of the uh, South Asian, in particular, markets, river markets. That's the kind of feel that George R. R. Martin, I suspect, was going for. Uh, for that, so that is an important part of uh, the uh, Dornish culture, having this major port there. Um, and the other one was um, a slightly more relaxed social attitude towards. Uh, sex and towards relationships. So Dawn, when we have this idea, we have Oberyn Martell, uh, who's there and he's got the sand snakes and he's got a paramour and that's okay. It's more than okay, in fact. This is uh, allowed, encouraged, uh, valued as a part of culture. Whereas in a lot of the Seven Kingdoms, there was a an element of either shame or um, let's just try and keep this out of polite society when it came to, to paramours and, and illegitimate children. When it comes to Dawn, because of the Royish influence, this is just accepted as a part of life. The sand snakes are not pariahs. They're a fully accepted part of uh, the upper echelons of Dornish society. So um, that is there, and that is important for the story, I personally would argue, in the place of Elia Martel. Now, Elia Martel, uh, married to Rhaegar, if he is taking on whatever this is with Lyanna, however you wish to interpret it, a paramour, a new wife, whatever, the the feeling within Westeros is of of course Elia must be mortified. Elia must hate this idea that her husband might be uh, taking up with another woman. No, not at all. That is actually not her culture. Her culture would be absolutely fine with it. And uh, if if we kind of take take a step back and go, really, she must have been a little bit jealous. George R. R. Martin is telling us no. For Elia Martel, this will not be the big deal that we might think this might be. So um, uh, modern language, uh, polyamorous relationships in Dawn are not just acceptable, they're welcomed and, and 
almost encouraged. So uh, that plays into Elia's uh, attitude towards Liana and Rhaegar. Um, Question from uh, E. Marty saying, off topic, <laughs> um, have you heard Alt Schrift X's Tyrion rap? Have I heard his Tyrion rap? It's good. Um, which character do you think you would uh, rap uh, off? I came up with Blood Raven. Uh, Blood Raven did it. Um, I, have, uh, I have not um, heard Alt Schrift X. And for those who don't know, uh, Alt Shift X, uh, excellent guy, excellent channel. Uh, he has a second channel called Alt Shift X, uh, which is slightly more, I don't know how he'd describe it. I would call it slightly more offbeat in a good way. Um, that's where he does live streams. That's where he does uh, random videos that are not just his, his usual excellent explanatory videos. Um, the fact that he's done a Tyrion rap does not surprise me in the least, um, and I am sure it is excellent. Um, I'm not, you'll be delighted to hear, going to rap, uh, but uh, yes, if I did, uh, uh, Blood Raven did it would probably be a, a good title. Um, Tyler Evans saying, what's your idea behind the Yin disappearance? Um, I have to admit this is one thing. There's always one thing uh, that I, I sort of, uh, if not overlook, then I can't off the top of my head come up with a, an immediate answer. I have not looked into the yin uh, disappearance. For those who don't know what the yin disappearance is, this is when uh, they got to Sothorios, um, uh, then uh, there, was, uh, there were troubles and there was a disappearance when people... Um, uh, they heard that a whole bunch of uh, the they'd split up. I'm not explaining this very well, but they'd split up to uh, uh, be trying to settle in Sothorius, and they get word, and Imeria gets word that just a whole load disappeared. Um, I haven't, uh, and that's when they got into the boats and went off. I haven't looked into that. I, I have to say so. I will uh, commit to looking into that between now and the next live stream. Uh, and somewhere either at the top or the bottom of, of the next live stream, I will answer this one for you. Um, because, yeah, it's an interesting one, uh, but I, it's not something that I've turned my attention to. Um, okay. Uh, let's go to question from uh, Creative Branches. Um, do you think Dornish mistrust of power and value of independence in sexual preference were influenced by their short visit to Sothorius, particularly their time in Yin and the Summer Islands? Maybe it has more to do with proximity to these very different cultural places, but I expect that they had a lasting influence on Dornish culture. Also, any chance they brought turtles over from Roin? Mention of a shell on a wall through Ariane or something? The old man of the river... Uh, turtle God is my favourite part of uh, uh, of the books, and I want turtles um, all up in the green blood and the rivers of dawn. Um, okay, so uh, first, the I, I think the where did the Dornish you say mistrust of power and value of independence in sexual preference, uh, etc. Um, I think that the egalitarianism and what we might call uh, social liberalism was a part of their culture already. I think that that's the, the implication. Certainly the um, allowing uh, or equal um, rights in inheritance was something which was there already in Moynish culture. And they seem a lot more relaxed. We don't know huge amounts about them, but they seem just very... Hey, come in, everyone. Relax. Uh, enjoy. The, the, there's enough of the wonderful bounty of Mother Roin for everybody. It seems slightly more um, hippie-ish than a lot of the more um, focused uh, religions that we have uh, elsewhere in Essos. So um, I think that probably came from there. Um, the There is a 
a bit in the world of ice and fire where they sort of vaguely, I mean, the maesters never like talking about this kind of stuff, pardon me, but um, they do talk about the idea that uh, most of those who came across were women. And uh, the um, uh, when Nymeria married into the Martell family, the idea was that they would try and marry as many other people in. She desperately wanted people settling there so she tried to get as many other people marrying in and when they couldn't they tried to set them up as paramours and this seemed to be part of their culture that they brought in to uh, to dawn so um it seems to have already been there and it seems to have been used as a political tool by nymeria who saying always comes across as very uh, very clever it has to be said um you're also talking about the turtles. Um, so we get, so the old man of the river, turtle god, is, so the, the big turtles, the massive turtles, I mean, and we're not just talking like big turtles, they, these are massive things in a massive river. Uh, they are worshipped by the Roynar. And the old man of the river, which is what the massive turtle is, is uh, an embodiment of the uh, the son of the mother Roin herself. So this is this is a hugely significant religious uh, thing, um, and they 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 do appear to be magnificent and beautiful. Is there any chance of them being in the green blood coming across the dawn? I don't think so. Personally, I think the if anything, the most likely thing is for the orphans to head over west to try to reclaim their where they were uh, on the ruin why might they do that well the the exile that they had was from the valerians and was from the dragons now where are the dragons and the Valyrians going to be in this last part of the story? They're coming across to Westeros. So if anything, the orphans would then wish to flee back because everything now is implying, suggesting that they should go back. Who are who are the main power in the Roin? Volantis. Volantis was the uh, the city which was where they the Garin the Great was going to attack. They were the, the, the great enemy. What's going to happen to them? Almost certainly Daenerys is going to take Atlantis down. It's, it's very, very likely. So if anything, I think if the, the orphans hear that this is what is happening, the dragons have come over and Volantis has fallen, it's more likely that they go back have this great uh, reunion with with Mother Roin. Uh, I like it. Uh, I don't know whether we'll actually see it. Uh, it might be a thing we just hear the sort of rumours of in the background. Uh, but it would be really good, wouldn't it? The, the the this people, this displaced people who've retained their culture all this time, the orphans, finally returning home when they can. Um, and perhaps they, I, mean, I don't know this again, this is just like, wouldn't it be great if perhaps once they have returned, they can then lift the curse of Garin. Maybe that could be the end of Grayscale. Um, question from, uh, Cloaked One, thank you very much, picking up for EP. Do you think the Roinar get some inspiration from Carthage. Um, you're stretching my historical knowledge here. I think, um, no, I'm gonna pass on that one this time. I, I'll, I'll only I'll only honestly answer questions that I feel I can add some value to. Um, uh, ancient Carthage uh, quite possibly is my instinct, but uh, let me come back on that one. So that's two I'm coming back on next time. Uh, sometimes I have one, but uh, two, okay. Um, uh, Mr. E. Knight, how does the story's conclusion involve Dawn, if at all? In the rebuilding phase, post-Long Night, does Dawn get involved or remain isolated? Um, well, in terms of the conclusion, where Dawn is going next is that they're going to be 
tying themselves in my take with the um Aegon Phaegon, Aegon the Sixth invasion. The the short reasons for this is that this is Doran Martel's always and forever plan is to marry himself in with the Targaryens. Uh, but also he has sent um, Ariane over there to go and check out what's going on uh, with this guy, Aegon. And he's going to find that his son, who he sent off to check out what was going on with Daenerys, his bones are going to come back. Uh, and his bones are going to come back. We know this is going to happen because Barristan said, I'll, I'll, send, I'll send the bones back. Um, out of respect, Barristan always uh, very right and proper, but perhaps not always the wisest. Um, he, he's going to send the bones back effectively with like a, a little note attached to them saying, uh, your son came over to meet Daenerys, offered to take a hand in marriage. She rejected him. She married someone else. Uh, and then she flew off in a dragon and we don't know where she is. Uh, and here's your son's bones. Uh, all of which the he's not Doran isn't going to want to side with Daenerys. Uh, he will side with uh, Fagon. So that's where House Dawn is going to. Oh, that's where House Martell and Dawn as a whole is going to be shifting their weight behind Fagon. Uh, so that's where their main role is going to be. Don't forget about House Dane and Dawn, the Sword of Dawn. That is going to come in probably through Dark Star. That is going to come into landing that route in terms of after all of this where does dawn go well we're not going to see i am pretty sure we're not going to see all of the aftermath of everything but dawn will retain its culture uh, it will probably retain some degree of independence maybe we will see who takes over after we've got a lot of people who potentially could take over afterwards. Um, yes, we we've already lost one of Doran's children. We've got another one, even if she uh, doesn't survive, then we've got a huge amount of sand snakes who could be taking over. So I think that there are lots of people there who could, who could take over um, the, there are two threats taking this at a meta level, there are two threats to Westeros. This is the song of ice and fire. Ice is attacking from the north and fire is attacking from the east. Um, the ice almost certainly won't reach down as far as dawn. Um, I suspect they will get below Winterfell on the show. I know they got only got as far as Winterfell, but that's quite a measly little invasion if that's all they get to. I suspect they may come down as far as the Riverlands or something like that in the books. Um, but in uh, the the dragons, they're going to be fighting in and around the centre of Westeros, but are they going to attack Dawn? I mean, only if George R. R. Martin wishes us to, to have an echo of that original Targaryen invasion of, of three dragons attacking Dawn, uh, the a Aegon and his sisters attacking Dawn. I think Dawn will survive is what I'm saying. I don't think that it's going to be destroyed by this. I think they will just carry on as they were before. Um, uh, Toto95, the 10,000 ships, I thought in Deep Geek kind of forgot about the Nymerian fleet. I don't think I did, but um, uh, yes, 10,000 ships, that's... Um, uh, that's what the subject of this is about. Uh, Jibber Dole saying, what does the name Nymeria have to do with Arya? Uh, well, the name Nymeria um, is known throughout the Seven Kingdoms. She's very famous. As a child, uh, then uh, Arya, as she was a child at the time, she chose uh, a, the name of a what she considered to be a warrior princess because that's what how she... She effectively, she's a princess of the North. She's not got the title princess, but she was growing up in House Stark uh, and she viewed herself quite rightly as a fighter. So she named her uh, direwolf after one of her heroes. So that's what the, the link is. I will come on. I've got a question specifically about the name Nymeria and the link across the direwolf in a moment. So I'll pick up on a little bit more of that uh, a little bit later. Um. 
Creative Branch is saying, I love challenging Robert with tinfoil. Well, you 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 did it. Um, the turtle god, uh, yeah, it's not coming to it, not coming to Westeros. Um, cloaked one picking up for C. McBroom. Uh, what can ruinish history tell us about the story now? Will the Martell survive like Nymeria did, or is her symbolism mainly for Arya's arc? In your opinion, I think her symbolism is mainly for Arya's arc. Um, but in terms of the the ruinish history, tell us about the story. With will the Martell survive like the um. Uh, like uh, Nymeria did, I mean, I could speculate and say that the the male members of House Nymeros Martel are falling. Oberyn's already fell, um, and uh, Quentin has fallen. Doran's not going to last long, surely. So, like. Uh, Nymeria uh, was left with predominantly female force uh, and leadership, and she eventually ended up ruling herself. Uh, that, I think, is probably where we're going to go. I mean, this is one of the things I don't think we can take much at all from the show storyline for, um, for Dawn, but the idea that the, um, the male... Um, members of House Martell die and the female members take over and rule kind of sounds about right. And that is an echo, I think, of, uh, of Nymeria. Um, but I'll pick up on Arya's arc again, as I say, in just a moment. Um, uh, duh, duh, duh. Okay. Okay. Um, Mondo uh, Mandavat saying, where was Gondor when the Westvold fell? Um, I've done a video on it. Um, uh, there's a very clear answer to that one, I think. Uh, exactly where Gondor should have been. Uh, Lawn Duck 20. Um, what is... Um, uh, what's the deal with people in Westeros burning and destroying their own ships? Both Nymeria and Brandon the Burner did did it, so what, in your opinion, was their reasoning? You would think ships would come in handy for protection or escape, but these leaders got rid of them nonetheless. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, yes, so uh, I these are two different things, I think. We've got Brandon the Burner up in uh, Winterfell, obviously. His father was a guy called Brandon the Shipwright. Now, Brandon the Shipwright built massive fleet and he headed west and was never seen again so brand his son understandably sad about this gutted hating the idea of ships now because his father went off in a ship and never came back burned all of the ships that were left um that's a very human story it's very understandable the starks Yes, it's useful for them to have boats, but it's not essential. They're, they're in the centre. They're, they're landlocked. The Win Winterfell itself is landlocked. Um, and they have others around, like House Manderley, um, uh, like the um, Mormonts, who are on the coast and have boats, and so they can deal with these things. So I think that's a different issue nymeria burning her ships as uh, and and they were burned crucially when she married into the martels so that was the moment that she did this burning and it was to show her people we're not moving on now this is it we're staying and this is because of looking back over the journey the times that they'd not they'd kept the boat the boats that they kept the ships and things had gone wrong, and they just got on the ships and moved on. And so the, the feeling amongst the people must have been, oh, we're in another place, something will go wrong here, and then we'll move on. And she wanted to say, no, this is it, we're done. Uh, this, incidentally, I think probably is a Tolkien nod. We know that George R. R. Martin is a, 
a huge fan of J.R.R. Tolkien. One of the, the stories in the Silmarillion um, is when the the Noldorin elves came back from Valinor to Middle Earth. Now they came across in some boats. There's a huge amount of backstory to all of this, but a whole load of elves came to Middle Earth, sailed across the sea. They went from uh, west to east rather than east to west, but they sailed across the sea. And when they arrived, they burned the boats. Feanor, the the, the leader of them, burned the boats. And uh, we're told that people could see this, uh, the pyre of all of the boats for miles away. Similarly, we get told with Nymeria that people could see the pyre of the burned boats from miles away. So this is a, this is a nod. And in both cases, it was to uh, to send a message. We're not going back. We're, we're, we're staying here now. This is, this is it. This is absolute. So I think... Um, I think there was a nod there to Tolkien. I think that there's a different situation going on there um, uh, with uh, Brandon the Burner. Uh, but yeah, it's it happens. It's a symbolic act to say we're not going on these boats. It's a practical act because you can't then go on the boats. But it's it's a it's a, a very symbolic way of doing it. Um, Toto ninety five saying it was a joke. D and D said Danny kind of forgot about the Iron Fleet during uh, GOT promo vids. Uh, you didn't get it. Shame. Uh, ding ding ding. Oh well, sorry. Um, yeah. So um, uh, the they they did say this. This was um, this was one of those really kind of sad moments. I'm not going to dwell on it too much. Um, apologies for not getting the joke. Uh, but uh, this was what they the. The showrunners said about why um, the dragons or one of the dragons got shot down by the Iron Fleet because Danny kind of forgot about the Iron Fleet. Um, uh, Thomas de Kirschmacher saying uh, George R. R. Martin scratched an excellent Tyrian chapter on the Roin meeting on the Roin meeting the Shrouded Lord. What do you think it could have contained, and what's up with the mist and double bridge glitch? Oh, there's a lot of questions in there. Uh, but as I'm doing quite well for time, so I'm I will happily answer these ones. So the context for this this bit, this is very connected in with the the, the Roinar. Tyrion is coming south on a boat down the River Roin uh, with Young Griff, Old Griff, all of the gang. Uh, they go through the ruins of Troy Rain, which is this city. This is where Garen the Great was from. This is where. He was put in a cage where uh, to witness the destruction of his own city. And from there, uh, he called on the River Rhoyne to destroy all of the, the Valyrians. And yes, the Rhoyne came up, washed away huge amounts of the Valyrians. And then later, they started developing grayscale. So this and, and what was left of Troy Rain became the Sorrows, this horrible ghostly mist covered place so um george r. r martin in has a chapter where they're going through and it's a really interesting really good chapter we get Tyrion uh, um having the struggles uh with the stone men uh, this is where john connington catches grayscale um there's a lot going on in that chapter there are Two things uh, here that you've asked about that I'll pick up on. The first one is the double going under the bridge. The, it's it's the kind of thing that you might not really notice the first time you read through it, but it, it's glaringly obvious when you when you do spot it, is that they go under, there's this bridge, uh, uh, three-tiered bridge, the centre part of the, uh, the city. They go under it. This is where the stone men congregate. Go under it, and then they go under it again, and that's when they get attacked. And the question is, what's going on? And everyone's saying, is it's a time travel thing? Um, I I think this is magical, but I think this is water magic, bringing the boat back around using the currents of the ri the river stretches in Troy Rain. It's all submerged, um, uh, a submerged city. So. The currents are all over the place, so they could get 
brought around by the current and come back again where they were before. And that um, uh, that happens just after we have this discussion of who young Griff is, a Targaryen, it is claimed. Uh, and at that point, the boat comes back around and the stone men attack. Why is that important, the fact that there's a Targaryen on board? Because this whole, the city being underwater, the, the stone men who were there, the victims of Grayscale, this is all because of Garin's curse, which was against the Valyrians. The Valyrians are long gone, but suddenly somebody coming through saying, I'm a Valyrian. And that, I think, is what was, was happening there. George R. R. Martin wrote an extended chapter here, um, which he has said that he, he wrote and then decided not to include in the book. And he's got it hidden away in a drawer somewhere. And he says, during his lifetime, he's not going to uh, he's not going to release this. Uh, it's going to be hidden away. Maybe after he dies, and some you know, executives of his will may sort of pull it out and, and and publish it or something. But it's it's not part of his story. He said that it took Tyrion in a direction he didn't want him to be going in on reflection. Um, and the clear implication is that he met the Shrouded Lord, the leader of the Stone Men. There. Now, what might have happened? I I don't know. I think that this was at the very um the as a base level, this is just a digression in Tyrion's story. He, the rest of his story would have carried on. He would have carried on going down. He he was always going to be heading down to meet Daenerys in the end. So this was not like him then going off on a completely different tangent, but this was taking him into a completely different magical place. Tyrion has always been this very kind of low fantasy character not particularly mixed up with the magic he started out scoffing at the very ideas of the others and things like that um he's been fascinated with dragons but he's largely avoided all of the sort of the magical stuff that's been going on through this story george R. R. martin i personally think on reflection, decided he could have taken him off, talking to the um, uh, the Shrouded Lord, getting involved with all of this Voynish magic, but actually Tyrion's story arc is taking him to Daenerys and to dragons, and that is where his arc started with him having dragon dreams. The first few Tyrion chapters, lots of dragon thoughts and talk and reflections, <clears throat> and even on the river, he's then writing a book about dragons. Uh, so dragons is Tyrion's magical journey, not Voynish water magic. So I think that's why he decided not to go that way. Um, question from... Um, Oh, last question from my uh, patrons, and I shall uh, dip into the chat and I'll answer some more there. This is the one I've sort of uh, teased a little bit but so far. Jenny Bird saying, hello, Robert, uh, enjoying the recent enha enhancements to your live streams. I'm pleased to hear that. Um, when uh, While the Game of Thrones TV show is certainly not book canon, it seems plausible that Arya may indeed sail off on an adventure at the end of A Song of Ice and Fire, considering Arya's direwolf is named Nymeria. Is there anything else we can glean from Nymeria's life story and accomplishments that might foreshadow Arya's story arc for the rest of the series? Um, thanks again for your content and for taking patron questions during your live streams. Well, I hope I can continue taking patron patron questions from my live streams uh, for a very long time. Um, got, certainly got no intention of stopping doing that. It's a really important part of what I see as me giving back to my patrons. But in terms of Aya and the, the direwolf names, for those, if there is anyone who's not come across this concept before, it's one of the, one of the building blocks of uh, George R. R. Martin's foreshadowing across the entirety of A Song of Ice and Fire is the idea that the names of the Starks, direwolves, 
direwolves um, offer some foreshadowing of the fate of that star. Not the fate of the direwolf, uh, but what happens to John Snow. His direwolf is called Ghost. What's going to happen to John Ghost? What, uh, to John Snow? He's going to die and then come back like ghosts do. So he's going to come back from the dead. Uh, Sansa, direwolf called Lady. The clear implication she's going to end up being Lady of Winterfell. This is, uh, and Bran now, the the show suggested that Bran is going to end up on the Iron Throne as we move into summer. His direwolf is called Summer, so he is ruling over Summer. That's his fate. But what about Nymeria? So Nymeria, um, the way that the show did this, as you say, and we can't take this as book canon, but at the end of this, Arya set sail and heads west. That's what Nymeria did. So is that what we've got here? Well, possibly. That's certainly one of the um, uh, the possibilities for Arya's final fate. The I think there's another one that she may walk into Nymeria and and live a life as a direwolf. I think that's, that's an equally. Um, likely thing she is not going to she's never going to settle down and lead the life of a noble lady in westeros i think that much is clear so she either has to not be a noble lady or leave westeros so it's possible but there are other elements of nymeria's story that do very clearly i think map into Arya's story first of all we get this idea that um she she loses um, her family, her friends, and then goes off um, from place to place. This is this is what happens to Arya. She she escapes. She heads off into the Riverlands. She goes all around the Riverlands. Then she goes. To, she's going to head off to Bravos, away from her actual home. All of this is being away from her actual home, um, but. Uh, the the key to what happened with Nymeria um, is that she creates a new home without ever losing her culture, without ever losing who she is. Uh, and this seems to be Aya's story, Aya's arc, is that she goes off and she might experience lots of different things in lots of different places and she may do the equivalent of marrying into them like with the faceless men uh, buying into that completely changing her name uh, but she never loses her essential starkishness and so fundamentally where she's going to end up and this is what the, the the Ned Stark thing is all about is that he's saying this isn't just about somebody who's really cool at fighting. This is about family. Um, so she will never ultimately abandon her family. She's going to look after them. She's going to fight for them all the way through to the end. Maybe afterwards she's going to head off to the West as well. Uh, I don't know. But the feel of it is that this is, yes, a warrior princess, but more than that, this is about never ever abandoning the matter where you are as far away from home as you are never abandoning your uh, your roots um question from let's have a quick look cloaked one um picking up one for Mattia dominique saying how would nymeria act differently from doran if she was in his situation, assuming she had a brother and sister who died and three kids as well, uh, if she had Marcilla in Sunspear. Well, we don't know because she's not um, she's not in that situation. I think that the, the difference between Doran and Nymeria appears to be that Nymeria wanted to create a safe place, a stable position for herself, for her family, for her people, and did that. She created that in Dawn. Nothing was going to get in her way. Once she created that, once she got that, 
she was actually content. She didn't have any particular need to expand beyond where she was. She she, she ruled for quite some time, um, having established her new place, her new home, without the need to go and invade anywhere else. That is different to Doran. Um, uh, Doran is seems to have um, two things going on. The first is this restless desire to have power across the Seven Kingdoms through marrying into the Targaryens. And the second is this need for revenge on the people who caused his family great pain. He doesn't... Do in, uh, we see it in Oberyn, um, uh, the Red Viper who actively goes out there and we see it coming out all over the place, how much he hates the Lannisters, how much he's after vengeance and justice. Doran feels the same, but he comes out in political machinations. And that, again, is different to Nymeria. Nymeria, we never see her. I mean, maybe she did. We, maybe it's not recorded, but we never see any hint that she thinks, how do I get revenge on the um, people who have wronged my family and my people? Uh, how do I get revenge on the Valyrians? She seems to have just been eminently pragmatic and says, this is a fight we can't win, so I'm moving on. That seems to be where she's at. She seems to have reached the point and says, Dawn, this is safe. I don't need to go any further. Eminently pragmatic. I'm stopping here. Every time she landed somewhere, it wasn't working. She moved on. She seems just very... Um, Although, yes, she was this great charismatic leader, she actually seems very grounded, very not wishing to push beyond the boundaries of what is reasonable and practical. Uh, when you get Doran, he appears, I mean, perhaps they're polar opposites, perhaps that's what I'm talking myself into, is that she appears to her legend is that of this great uh, warrior princess, but in reality, she's very prudent and pragmatic. Doran's reputation is the opposite of being this great political pragmatist, but in reality, he's very ambitious and wanting to, uh, to sort of uh, extend his power all over the place. So, yeah, maybe they're, maybe they're opposites. Um, uh, Richard McCarthy saying, wow, the man is still streaming. <laughs> this is some hardcore Song of Ice and Fire nerding. Uh, well, thank you. Yeah, I do. I, I go on until I've answered um, as many questions as I can, or my voice gives out. Um, uh, Ian Kaplinsky saying, do you think George R. R. Martin will take any fan theories into his writing and intentionally subvert them? I can see him enjoying that. If so, which theories? Um, I mean, I can see him enjoying it, but I think he he is deliberately insulating himself against them now. It's um, th there are some times when you know, people do put things in front of him, but now he deliberately does not react to things uh, for fear of giving away any bits of uh, plot. But um, um, I don't think, I don't think, well, I mean, he has a very uh, cheeky, sometimes silly sense of humour. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I would love the, the idea of like some absolutely crazy theory, um, him just sort of like having somebody mention it randomly and then move on would appeal to his sense of humour. I, I have no doubt. But I do not think that this is going to um, affect the way that he writes the story, because the way he writes it is allowing the characters and the plot and the situations to drive the action. Um where he gives nods to things in the outside world, it's more often names of things um, doing a nod to something else by, by having characters named after the Three Stooges or, or uh, having somebody called Kermit. Uh, th these kinds of things that amuse him uh, and nods to things from writers that he hugely loves rather than actual huge bits of plot. Um, having uh, having a quick flick through now just to see if there's any more quick questions. Um, 
Reflective Rambling saying, I actually don't buy the ship burning was just nope, no more. A fleet is a powerful tool. I don't know what else was going on, but I suspect something lost to history. Yeah, it's entirely possible. Um, the In terms of her... Um, in terms of what we're told, this is this is the story, so that we don't have anything else to to hang on to. As you say, maybe something else was lost to history. I think, as I said, this is a nod to Tolkien, and I think that's what he did. And I think that he could tell the story with doing a little nod, um, and then keep on moving. It doesn't affect anything because a lot of Dawn is inland rather than coastal. So uh, in terms of the settlements, uh, so actually having a fleet isn't going to be, yes, it would help in places like Starfall maybe, but when you get uh, a lot of the house fowler and places like that, no, this doesn't, this isn't going to help them in the slightest. So um, uh, it, it, it does, it's not, a stupid, stupid, stupid decision. And I suspect that if everything we know about her is very pragmatic, um, it was that she felt that there was a need to do this because otherwise her people would not commit to this. And the only way that this was going to work if they were going to commit, as there may be some other reasons, as you say, lost to history, but that it, it does make sense to me. Uh, Thomas de Kirschmacher saying, I would love to see a Duncan Egg-like story of characters just before Game of Thrones, not Robert's Rebellion, but following people like a younger Oberyn. Yeah, that would be fantastic. Uh, Jokin Hagar saying, I just realized I'm wearing my In Deep Geek shirt. What a wonderful coincidence. Every one of these should own one of these. Everyone should own one of these beautiful, comfortable shirts available in several colors. Thank you very much for that. Um, Mark Adams, thank you very much for the, uh, the super sticker. I very much appreciate that. Um, um, I think with that, we are probably uh, coming to an end. So uh, let me just say what's coming up. What's coming up next time is we're going to look at the last of the great invasions that happened uh, in Westeros, the Targaryen invasion. This is, again, a very different one because we've had this sort of slow drip, drip, drip Targaryen, uh, Andal invasion. Before that, we had this very long running um, movement of people being the first men. We've just been looking today at uh, Nymeria's invasion, which was um, in one go, one big whole load of ships arriving at the same time. Again, this is very different. This is an invasion by three people, <laughs> three people with a dragon each. So this is a very, very different dynamic, and we're moving forward a lot closer to the timescale of the story that we're um, listening to um, uh, at the moment. Okay, so um, uh, that's what we're doing next week. In two weeks' time, we'll have another Tolkien live stream, uh, the last one. People seem to really enjoy that, so I will see whether I can get uh, another Tolkien creator on here, introduce you to, uh, to some more people in the wonderful world of uh, Lord of the Rings content creators. Um, okay, if you uh, would like to watch some more of these live streams, there's a link appearing somewhere up here a bit later. And if you uh, would uh, like to support this channel, then the best way to do that is by clicking this link here to my Patreon page. Okay, take care, everyone. I shall see you again next week.